Good evening, and thank you to the Seattle Public Library and also to MAPS and CARE, Muslim Americans of Puget Sound, and the Council on uh, American Islamic uh, Relations, who are um, helping co present and get word out about this event tonight. So this evening, we're going to, going to have a speaker, and the speaker is going to be followed by a panel discussion, and I'm going to um, read some, some brief bios of all the speakers, so you'll have a little uh, information about them. We also have some imp more information on the screen in front of you, so if you'd like to know more. So our featured speaker tonight is writer and human rights lawyer Arjun Singh Sethi. He's based in Washington, D.C. He works closely with Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and Sikh communities and advocates for racial justice, equity, and social change at both the local and national levels. He holds faculty appointments at Georgetown University Law Center and Vanderbilt University Law School and presently co-chairs the American Bar Association National Committee on Homeland Security, Counterterrorism, and the Treatment of en Enemy Combatants. He's here tonight with his book, American Hate, Survivors Speak Out, published by the New Press, in which he documents the effects of hate crimes on people's lives. And these hate crimes and the people and their families um, share their own stories with you. So it's quite an, quite an interesting and very personal account about the ways in which hate crimes affect us. So the people targeted by hate and subject to bullying, discrimination, and violence come from a variety of ethnic backgrounds and include immigrants, refugees, queer people, and people with disabilities. Our panelists, panelists this evening are Matt Remley from the Hunk Papa Lakota. He's the editor and writer for the online native news site Last Real Indians and LR Inspire. He's also um, the author of the Seattle Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution. And in 2014, he was awarded Seattle's Individual Human Rights Leader Award. Soya Jung is a senior partner at Change Lab, and she's been active in the progressive movement for at least the last 30 years, working as a journalist, legislative staff, community organizer, and progressive grant maker. She's written and researched and organized on issues of immigration, police accountability, welfare, and progressive philanthropy. Also here tonight is Anila Afzali, and she is the executive director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. She's a board member of the Faith Action Network and a steering committee member of the Washington Immigration Solidarity Network. She was named one of 2017's most influential people by Seattle Magazine and recognized as a rising star multiple years by Washington Law and Politics. Also joining us tonight is Shakori Tunkara from the Northwest Detention Center Resistance. So um, without further ado, please join me in first welcoming Akun to the Seattle Public Library. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Arjun Sethi. Um, thank you to the Elliott Bay Book Company for supporting this event. Uh, thank you to the Seattle Public Library for hosting us. I want to start by just acknowledging that I know there is a lot of pain and grief generally um, in this political moment, and there's a lot of fatigue sometimes in talking about these issues. So thank you for being here, and thank you for being here on this particular day. Um, for those of you who heard the news or watched the news, um, some of the worst forces in America were on full display for the world to see. Um, whether it be sexism, misogyny, and rape culture. Um, so in many ways, I know it's an ask uh, to generally be here and especially be here this night. So thank you for your courage and thank you for your bravery. And I hope you will leave this conversation uh, informed and empowered. The United States was built on a hate crime, the decimation and destruction of native communities, and was furthered on additional hate crimes including slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. 
But it's nevertheless a fact that hate has spiked during the run-up to the 2016 election and under the Trump administration. I'm a community activist. I work closely with Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and Sikh communities. And that's what I was hearing in 2016 and 2017, that hate was spiking in every facet of American life, in the workplace, the classroom, public life. And so I thought it was important to take to the road, meet with survivors in their homes, houses of worship, community centers, and document their stories. And that is what American Hate Survivors Speak Out is. The introduction situates this political moment. It talks about the emboldening and the inciting of hate in Donald Trump's America. The conclusion lays out best practices to address hate, to address state violence. The body of the book is otherwise 14 testimonials from people who have been directly impacted. When I initially set out, I had thought to only include the most searing examples of hate violence in the book. And then I realized I would be doing a disservice to impacted communities because hate manifests in so many forms, which is why in my book, you will find stories of bullying, vicious cyber trolling, vandalism and arson of houses of worship, and regrettably in some cases, murder. Let me also revisit the word testimonial because this is a, uh, a question that I get often. What is a testimonial? How did I decide on this form? There is an overwhelming sentiment among survivors of hate in the United States that their stories are trafficked, that the media is interested in clickbait, and they don't have an opportunity to actually tell their stories in their own words, which is why I traveled across the country, went to places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Whitefish, Montana, uh, Victoria, Texas, and would meet with survivors for many hours, sometimes over a period of days, would record their interview, transcribe it, usually tr transcription was anywhere from 10 to 50,000 words, and then I would shorten it into a three to 5,000 word essay that again was entirely in their words, that in some cases was slightly reordered to make it accessible for a reader in a book. And I will tell you that in many ways it was an experiment. When I hit send on the 14 draft testimonials to all the survivors in the book, I feared that they would come back to me and say, this isn't my story. I gave you 30,000 words. You gave me 4,000 words. The way you've ordered it doesn't give primacy to what's most important to me. But fortunately, every survivor in this book, and as was noted in the introduction, the survivors include native voices, queer, trans, Muslim, Sikh, refugee, Latinx, undocumented. Every single survivor came back to me and said, this is my story. Thank you for including it. And one thing I'm doing as part of the book tour as I'm trying to incorporate survivors in community conversations across the country so that they can continue to tell their stories and continue to stay connected um, to really what they experienced. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in, um, read a few of the stories from the book so you have a sense of what it is I was trying to accomplish and um, some of the folks in the book. The first testimonial I'm going to read from is Asma al Bukaye. Asma al Bukaye was the first Syrian refugee to ever be resettled in Boise, Idaho. And she talks in her testimonial about how she experienced all kinds of hate and discrimination being a refugee, being a Muslim, and being a Muslim who also wears her hijab. She also talks about how her young son was the target of a hate crime. And here's her recounting that episode, again, in her words. In February 2016, my son came home one evening with a terrible bruise on his face. He told me what happened. I was with my friend, and a big American guy came up to me and asked, are you Muslim? I told him, yes, I am Muslim. Then he punched me in the face, and I cried. My friend then called the police. My son was very clear. Still, I thought he must have done something wrong. 
As refugees, we're always afraid that the police or the government will send us home, even when we're the victims. All was made clear the next day when I received a call saying that my son was in fact the victim of a hate crime. I don't want to say much because my son is still young, but everything changed for him that day. He became less trusting and it was harder for him to make new friends. One day he asked me, should I lie next time? If people ask me if I'm Muslim, should I tell them I'm not? I told him he should be proud to be a good Muslim and proud of his identity. I hope he listens. I went to the last hearing in the court case because the judge asked for a statement. I told the judge that the man in the courtroom who hurt my son wouldn't learn love and respect from a jail cell. He needed to be educated. He needed to learn that we are refugees who ran away from war, that we seek safety and don't want to hurt anyone. I told the judge that I had forgiven the offender and that my forgiveness was an example of how to respect and love others. The judge nevertheless sentenced him to time in jail and community service. I read that excerpt because it really shows um, a trend that I saw among survivors, that they're open and willing to have difficult conversations. In some cases, they are practicing restorative justice in the most carceral state in modern history. The next story I'm gonna read from is Taylor Dumpson. Taylor Dumpson is an African-American woman who took the bold step of running for student body president at American University in Washington, D.C. last year. This is a university that is five miles from the White House. The day that Taylor took office, nooses were found hanging across campus. Here is Taylor reflecting on that episode and what collective liberation looks like. The entire room erupted when they announced my victory. Seeing the freshmen yell in excitement because they had a president that looked like them meant the world to me. I won by just 129 votes. I was sworn in on April 30th, 2017. The very next morning, on May 1st, bananas were found hanging from nooses made of black nylon rope in at least three separate locations on AU's campus. The bananas were marked with the letters AKA, -A, the abbreviation for the historically black sorority Alpha Kappa Alpha, of which I'm a member. Grainy video footage shows a person in a stocking cap hanging them between 4 and 6 a.m. The FBI and DOJ are investigating it as a hate crime. I decided to put out a statement that first day because so many students were terrified. I said that we would get past this together and that all members of our community should feel safe and welcome. I reminded them of the words of Frederick Douglass, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. I also told them that being first, in other words, being the first African-American woman to ever hold the title of student body president at American University was never easy. This is the end of her testimonial. Black women have always been at the forefront of civil rights and solidarity work in this country. I'm proud that Black Lives Matter was founded by black women and I support their vision. When black people are free, we will all be free. But I think we should push ourselves even further. We must remember those who are at the intersection of various forms of marginalization including black queer and black disabled women. Only when the most vulnerable among us are free will we all be free. Only then will we rise. The next story I'm gonna read from is Jeanette Vizguera. Jeanette Vizguera is an undocumented Latinx activist who was one of the first undocumented activists to take immigrants, I should say, to take sanctuary at a house of worship during the Trump administration. And this is about her decision to take sanctuary and again reflecting on her future. In early February 2017, my children and I gathered around our dinner table. I told them that men in uniform might come to our home and take me away. Luna 12, Roberto 10, and Zuri 6 looked at me and listened. They knew we were different from other families. I'm undocumented and they were born here. The only way I could stay safe 
was to take sanctuary at a local church and trust that the government would honor the sanctity of the house of worship. Their father and my eldest daughter, Tanya, who's 26, would take care of them. I gave the children explicit instructions. If somebody knocked, don't open the door. If somebody entered, Luna should film. Roberto should run to the refrigerator and call the first person on the community contact list. And Zuri should run to the bedroom and close the door. I feared for their safety. I didn't want to leave my family, but I was scared that immigration and customs enforcement would tear us apart. Jeanette, who is no longer in sanctuary, who has status, um, is here in this final passage reflecting on her future. As I continue this work in the years ahead, I know that I will experience racism and hate, but I will press on because I want a better future for my children. I also know that one day I may be forced to leave this country, but it won't be without a fight. I will protect what I've earned and built. I will protect my family and the love and community we enjoy. And if I am deported, I will hold my head up high. From the day I arrived more than 20 years ago, I fought for what I believed. My children will continue this fight long after I'm gone. This is our home. One of the things that is very striking about Jeanette's story is that it shows the intersection between hate violence and state violence. When Jeanette took sanctuary at the First Unitarian Church in Denver, and she was there for four months, and she talks in the testimonial how she thought she would be there for four years, the entirety of the Trump administration. She talks about how when she was in sanctuary, the church received threats to blow up the church, all because they had given her sanctuary. I'm gonna read from two more testimonials. Um, Alexandra Brodsky is a Jewish American uh, uh, activist, civil rights lawyer, survivor of gender violence. She was viciously cyber trolled on account of being Jewish American uh, and on account of her um, work on behalf of survivors. I won't say much more. Um, I just want you to think about how prescient Alexandra's testimony is considering what you heard today on full display in the Supreme Court. In the days following the election, I staffed the national hotline run by the National Women's Law Center through which students and families could report incidents of discrimination in school. We heard a similar story time after time. Girls were being groped on the playground by boys claiming that if the president could do it, so could they. In a 2017 report, the National Women's Law Center reported that more than one in six girls, ranging in age from 14 to 18, had experienced harassment since Trump's election. Women aren't safe in schools, workplaces, public life, or online. Boys and men across the country are parroting the president. When I was in school, which in Alexandra's case happened to be Yale, I remember survivors expressing trepidation about coming forward because they feared that their abusers would retaliate. Their abusers were wealthy white boys or young men whose parents could seek legal counsel and quickly attack the reputation of a survivor and discredit her story. They feared speaking out because their abusers could be the congressmen, senators, judges, CEOs, or presidents of tomorrow. The campaign and victory of Donald Trump confirmed their worst suspicions. The last testimony I'm gonna read from, and then I'm gonna wrap up and turn it over to our extraordinary panel, is Surat Swang. Surat Swang is a queer activist, a Cambodian refugee, who is the executive director of an organization called the Providence Youth Student Movement based in Providence, Rhode Island. Few days after the election, Surath walked into his organization's office in Providence and found that the equipment had been rearranged, knives were stabbed into the community desk, and a noose was hanging from the ceiling. One of the things that makes Surat's story so extraordinary is they are an abolitionist organization, so they decided not to call the police. And here is a brief summary about that decision. We also decided not to call the police. We are an abolition organization and believe in the abolition of the police and military. Think of it this way. We came to this country because of US militarism. Then we got here and were targeted by state violence, like the surveillance 
The school to prison pipeline, police brutality, mass incarceration, and even deportation back to our home countries. The police and military pose the greatest threat to our safety and dignity. So why should we call them in our time of need? If abolition was one of our values, we had to stick to it in this moment. So here's the thing. Long after the media loses interest, long after the public moves on, the front lines of protection, the front line that supports survivors, are local community activists. Local community activists like the ones you're going to hear from today. So I would encourage you after the discussion to speak with them, figure out a way to get involved because they do really important work. And ultimately, they were also my gateway to survivors. The last thing I would say, um, actually I can't, um, it's, it's emotional for me. Um, yeah. Um, Maybe in a little bit, but with that, why don't we go ahead and turn it over to the panel. I have known Arjun for a little bit, and I just want to say I really respect not only the work that he's done to write the book and to put it together, but the way that he's gone about this tour with his book. He's made very specific attempts to reach out to local communities and local activists to connect the stories that he documents in the book with local struggles wherever he's going to. So I, you know, I really want to commend him for that. Not every author does that. Um, and you know, as heavy as the topic is, um, I did read the book, um, and I just want to say that, you know, with every story of violence, you know, these words, hate and crime and violence, there are also stories of redemption, reconciliation, love, agency, community. Um, and that really comes through so powerfully in the book. Uh, when I first picked it up and started to read it, you know, I had this sort of trepidation about what would, what would I find in those pages, but what was so heartening to me is, you know, as he writes in the book, uh, he says, a single hateful act can reveal the worst in humanity and the response, the most compassionate. Um, and so, with this panel of my friends here this evening, I also want to invite us to think about, um, as we connect uh, the topics of the book to what's going on locally in Seattle, um, those themes of not only hate and violence, but also reconcilia reconciliation and our, our own agency. Um, so, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to, um, I'm going to start with Anila and sort of go down the line, if that's okay. Um, so, um, Anila, we've heard a little bit about you. Um, one of the things that I was so moved by when I was kind of researching and learning about the work that you've been doing is that you and your community have been faced with such extreme uh, examples of hate and violence and hostility. And yet, in the face of that, you've chosen to turn outward and to sort of do this rural road show and to go into communities where you knew that you may not be welcome, where you knew that there may be stereotypes of you and your people, and you've had conversations. And you've also educated people about what the multi-billion dollar industry is that's driving Islamophobia today in this country. And I wonder if you can just share with us tonight, um, tell us what is the scope of this problem in Washington State? and some of the work that you've been doing and the impact that it's had. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Soya, for the question. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Sethi, for your book, for your compassion, for your willingness to share these stories and really highlight some of what's happening in our own country, in our own neighborhoods. Uh, and I have to start by saying that I myself have not been a victim of a hate crime of the nature that you've described in your book, but I know many survivors. And I also know that there are survivors in this room right now with us and families of survivors, including some people that I could point to here. Uh, so I know that this is, can also be very triggering uh, and again, as, as, as you pointed out, uh, Professor uh, Sethi, just today's watching the media, the news today, uh, has been a very triggering day for a lot of other people who've been impacted in many multiple different ways of sort of violence in different ways. So I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, for me personally, uh, one thing that has been powerful is, and I think uh, uh, Arjun's recognized this, is when you see these individual acts of hate, 
the overpowering, overwhelming response of compassion and solidarity and love and unity, that's what gives me hope and strength and inspiration. Like when our mosque, the mosque that I'm with, was attacked twice in less than a month. We had the neighborhood, we had the wider community show up in response, show up in solidarity, show up with compassion, and really prove that love is far greater than hate. And that's really essentially the message of what I'm doing with both helping educate people and then also help build that kind of solidarity, help build the coalitions that we need and mobilize each other to take action to prevent these kinds, this kind of hate. Because what I often tell people, you know, these individual forms of hate, they are often the symptoms of a much deeper problem. And that deeper problem is racism, is Islamophobia, is sexism, is homophobia, all of these underlying uh, roots of the hate crimes themselves. And trying to address those underlying roots is part of what the, the work that I do. And I have this poster over here that gives a little sense of the Islamophobia industry and some of the individuals, the groups who are behind and the funding that is promoting this kind of Islamophobia. Because as I tell people, it's not just generalized prejudice against Muslims. There is an intentional propaganda effort there is an intentional weaponizing of fear and manipulating people to try to create divisiveness, to try to promote things for political gain, for profit gain, and for other reasons. And it's really incumbent on all of us as people to recognize that, to understand it, and to take action against it. That's what I'm trying to do. And with this roadshow that we do, me and Pastor Terry Kylo, we've been going to smaller towns across Washington state and really help educate people about the Islamophobia industry, about these uh, forms of hate and, and uh, attempts to create hate and divisiveness, and really try to build a narrative of love and unity. Really try to show that love is far greater than hate, show that, uh, that facts are much stronger than the fiction and the fear mongering that these groups and individuals promote and show that faith is far greater than fear. I get to live that every single day and I get to try to work around helping others recognize that and really build those narratives so that we can work together in, in sort of cooperative ways to challenge that fear, that hate, that misogyny, that sexism, that Islamophobia, that anti-Semitism, all of these things are related. And helping people understand the interconnection between these various forms of hate and really the, the kind of role that we can play. And one final point, as, as Professor uh, Sethi recognized, you know, one other really dangerous part of all of this hate is the state-sponsored role in it, the institutional forms of Islamophobia, of racism, and other forms of it, right? And really recognizing that when it comes to anti-Muslim bigotry and bias, the institutional forms, the state forms of Islamophobia are actually some of the most dangerous, whether it's coming from the rhetoric at the top or laws that are in place, anti-Muslim legislation, whether it's the Muslim travel ban, whether it's uh, surveillance programs, informant programs, registries, all of these currently exist and have existed and to recognize the role that they play in promoting a culture of hate, and they're not just against Muslims. That's what I try to help people understand. Islamophobia does not just hurt me, it hurts every single American, every single one of us, of us who cares about sort of our democracy, our values, our civil rights, our liberties. It hurts all of us, and it's incumbent on all of us to work together to challenge that so that we can all be safer and live better lives. Thank you, Anila. And I should say, um, as moderator, I'm sort of in the unenviable position of keeping time. <laughs> we do have a short amount of time with such incredible speakers, and so I will alert you when you have about 30 seconds left. I was within um, my time, right? You were great. You, just do whatever Anila just did. Just do that. Um, um, and we're going to also ask each speaker to share with us their ideas about what's been effective, what they're experimenting with, what they see as having an impact um, in the second round of questions. But Shakori, um, I wonder if, you know, in this Trump era, we've heard so much, there's been a lot of attention paid to the kind of relentless attacks on immigrant families. Um, and, but I think that very few people know and understand the conditions that people face who are incarcerated whether it be in prisons or jails or immigration detention centers. And so I wonder if you can, uh, and also some people don't understand how long it's been going on, right? It predates the Trump era. Um, so I wonder if you can share with us your own story um, and then also a little bit about what the Northwest Detention Center Resistance is doing. Hello, thank you very much for having me um, here. Um, I do work with the Northwest Detention um, Center Resistance. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, the immigration jail that we have here is located in Tacoma. 
um, in the industrial area where no houses or apartment buildings or anything is where people live. So it's completely away from um, residential space and area and for good reason. Um, it's what you call a super sun fight where it's site where it's located, where the soil is toxic. Um, the pollutants in the air, so that smell that you smell when you go to Tacoma is chemical. Um, so also this past week, we've been just all over the place because Monday there was a fire um, 300 meters away from the detention center um, where it was scrap metal that caught, caught on fire and they said it was because of a battery that um, combusted. Um, they didn't evacuate any of the detainees. They didn't tell them what was going on. They could smell it and they were asking like what's happening but no one told them anything as they were evacuating people who lived in the residential areas telling them to close their doors and windows and don't go out. Um, meanwhile, the detainees are inhaling all the smoke. Um, there's also been a second, because it was one this year already, a second varicella outbreak um, where seven pods have been, um, I wouldn't say it's active, but they've been exposed to it, seven pods. So that's about 400 people who have been in contact with varicella, which um, is the virus that causes chicken pox. And it's not as bad when you're a kid, but when you're an adult, it becomes shingles. So it's, it's way more comfortable and um, very easy to catch. You can catch it by contact or even talking with, to someone in the same space. Um, also, we had people going on hunger strike because they couldn't get medical care. Um, there's a guy in there who had a hernia hanging outside of the abdominal cavity that he had to hold in with his, his hand. Um, and a surgeon agreed to do the surgery and ICE just wouldn't let him go. So um, he'd been, you know, trying to deal with that. And we were fighting with them back and forth about just getting him like a belt to put on to keep it in or um, he was on the top bunk and he kept asking to go to the bottom bunk and they just wouldn't let him go to the bottom bunk. I don't know if you've seen the jail beds, but there's no ladder. So he'd have to, you know, try to have a hard time getting up there. Um, so that's the thing that's going on with them. I personally um, am experiencing some things because my husband is there um, and he's been there since January of this year and he was diagnosed with a tumor on the right side of his neck. We told ICE when they took him. Um, he had a surgery date to get it removed and a surgeon that agreed to do it. We had the insurance, everything was going um, and ICE made him miss his surgery date. So he sat in there until you know it got bigger and bigger and bigger and I complained and complained and went and talked with them and got the medical records and did all these things. So they finally let him have the surgery in April, um, April 27th of this year. But they didn't do any of the aftercare patients things that they were supposed to get him like physical therapy. So his arm is disabled um, because they waited so long for that. And then recently we found out he's losing his vision. So he's going blind and there's nothing that could be corrected with surgery. So it's not like glaucoma or cataracts or anything like that. So he's indefinitely gonna go blind, how fast and when, we don't know. Um, he has glasses now that he wears, and before he went in there, he didn't have any glasses. Um, and now he has asthma as well, which is ironic, considering the pollutants and stuff in the air, um, and heart failure. So my husband's been in there this long, and his health is declining that fast. And we go out and we talk to the mayor's office, we go and we talk to the Congress office, we go and we talk to Senate, and everybody's just like, it's a federal issue. But I'm saying it's a humanity issue. Everybody deserves to have medical care, and it doesn't have to be five-star medical care. But if these people are this sick, let them out so that they can heal. So um, that's the thing that I've been going through right now with my husband, besides the being separated from him and the bills and me and the kids, the kids are in therapy. I'm in therapy and I'm on medication. My kids are seven and nine and they've been diagnosed with PTSD, so. Thank you, Shakur. And just to be clear, the Northwest Detention Center is a privately run It is privately facility, run, right? yes. It's privately ran by um, GEO Group and they have several prisons, private prisons across the country. Um, ICE is the boss, if you will, of the facility and that's another thing that gets me. Because when I talk to ICE, they're like, oh, we don't have anything to do with that. Go talk to these people. So, you know, they give you the runaround of that. But, yeah, it's privately owned, and they get to do whatever they want. 
Even ICE gets to do whatever they want. They don't have a boss. So I have no one to complain to. We're going to come back around and ask Shakori what we can do about this problem. Matt, um, a lot of times when we think about hate violence, we think about people who are attacked because of some aspect of their identity. Um, and I wonder if you can help us kind of expand that idea to forms of colonial violence um, that um, create conditions that are conducive to violence, particularly in the effects on indigenous women and girls. And if you can tell us a little bit about that, um, just to kind of expand our concepts of how we think about hate violence. Charles Remley, Ina Wayagi, Donna Harrison, Tukashila Wahantaka, Ampetukile Wopila, Ampetukile Wowashte Yoha, Lena Wichasha, Na Wia, Wopila, Na Owichak Yayo, Duamasho Yate, Duamash Makochegi, Owichak Yayo. Well, good evening. My English name is Matt Remley. My Lakota name is Wakia Wa Anatan. I am from Standing Rock, but live here in Seattle. And first uh, and foremost, want to give acknowledgement uh, to the Duwamish people for whom's land that we're guests on. I'd like to thank you for the good work that you do with your book and uh, bringing this issue out, as well as to the other panelists. Uh, and my heart goes out to you and your family. Uh, prayers for your, you and your, your children, your husband, and that he gets out of there as, as quickly. <clears throat> And, uh, and thank you, Soya, who I've known for many decades now since we were out on these streets right out here protesting WTO. <laughs> so, and thanks to my wife. <laughs> um, and thank you for that question. I really uh, appreciate uh, the expanding of uh, the ways in which we look at uh, violence in terms of the uh, kind of original violence and that being uh, the one that's thrust upon Onchimaka, our grandmother Earth, of which, who which is our, all of our first mother. Uh, before I jump into that though, I, I, I do need to just share briefly, since we're in the lands of the Duwamish, you know, it was in 1860s that the forerunner of the Seattle City Council, uh, when that, that government was formed, and it passed its kind of first set of ordinances and laws. Uh, ordinance five, was, was, which was one of its first laws that the Seattle government passed, uh, banned any native peoples from being allowed to be in the Seattle city limits. This was followed, of which who were predominantly Duwamish and Suquamish peoples at that time. That was followed by a period all the way up until 1910 where uh, colonial occupiers, uh, vigilantes, were going around to the longhouses of the Duwamish people, uh, roughly 96 of them, and they burnt them down. A longhouse is a massive structure that could hold about 100 plus people in it. So <clears throat> the one exception they made in their ordinance of banning native peoples uh, from city limits was that if you were considered a worker of a, a colonizer, then you were allowed within uh, the city limits at a certain time. That exemption was put in because of the brothels that were down here in Pioneer Square, of which it was predominantly Native women, Duwamish women, who were placed in those brothels, and at that time the city was taxing them. So Seattle's wealth did not come from Amazon.com or any of the other tech industries. Seattle's wealth is built on settler colonialism, the theft of Duwamish people's lands and uh, from uh, Native women. Why well, I uh, appreciate the, the question on the, the violence against Unchimaka is that settler colonialism is about the uh, uh, colonization and uh, of moving into indigenous lands, removing indigenous peoples uh, to access uh, those resources for the benefit of settler colonial communities. The United States is not a post-colonial 
uh, country. We are still living in uh, an under settler occupation, colonial occupation. And if you look at where uh, all the conflicts that we had uh, with the United States from 1492 on to, to now, to this day, is, uh, has been around the uh, removal of indigenous populations to access our lands, to gain, um, uh, to, to gain access to, to resources to benefit their populations. The other thing that you would, so there, obviously there's mass violence that, uh, and genocide that took place uh, in, 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 during the, uh, um, from 1800s into now. 30 seconds, Matt. Okay, and wherever you see, uh, the, the, to this day, this, the resource extraction taking place is predominantly on indigenous lands, the fracking, the mining, and uh, wherever that takes place, what follows is uh, these massive man camps. We're seeing this in the, the Dakota region where our people are from when the Bakken oil shell was discovered about 10 years ago. And uh, these man camps, men from around the world come and work in these man camps. And the next thing that happens is the, the disappearance and the theft of indigenous women who are being placed into these man camps. We have a, a what's called missing and murdered indigenous women and uh, where thousands of native women have been disappeared oftentimes in these, uh, these man camps. And so uh, wherever you see violence against earth, the violence against women, the violence against indigenous communities uh, follows. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Maybe in the next round we can um share some resources where people can learn more information about what's happening. Um, Arjun, um, I know for all of us, this is an emotional day. I can say for myself, I, you know, shed tears today, had lots of anger, lots of emotions kind of up and down. Um, so I really thank you for acknowledging that right off the bat when you started. I wonder if you can just share some reflections based on what you've heard from these panelists about the relationships between the work that they've described and the problems that they've described and, and your experience of writing the book. Um, I, I don't think that we can separate state violence and hate violence. I think they are inseparable. Um, I think hate is part of this country's DNA. And I think you are absolutely right. It's a mistake to call the United States a post-colonial country. Um, we are colonial. Um, and even if you think about what we do internationally, um, Guantanamo Bay is and always has been a prison for Muslim men. Extrajudicial drone strikes disproportionately impact Muslim-majority countries. Climate change has hit the global south the hardest with six of the 10 countries most impacted um, being in uh, Africa. There we go, sorry. Um, so I think we need to, to talk about the international component as well. And really, I mean, if you're thinking about the intersection between state and hate violence, um, in some ways, at least in the context of this administration, it's almost kind of intuitive, it's common sense. Um, if the president, as Anila pointed out, is going to ban Muslims and refugees, it's going to have an impact. Cage and separate immigrant families deprive folks of life-saving health care. Um, it's going to have an impact. Um, I want to yield the time to everyone else, but the, the, the one sort of, sort of story or factoid I will give you, if you ever run into anybody who thinks that policies don't matter or rhetoric doesn't matter, let me give you a very concrete example, and this is from the book. In December 2016, sorry, December 2015, Donald Trump on the campaign trail said he was going to ban Muslims from entering the United States. That day, a pig's head was, out, was found outside the Al-Aqsa Islamic Society in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The spokesperson for that mosque tells his story in this book. Fast forward. In January 2017, in one of his first acts as president, Donald Trump signed an executive order banning Muslims and refugees from entering the United States. That night, a mosque in Victoria, Texas was burned to the ground. Both of those stories are in the book. Rhetoric matters, policy matters, and more so than anything, so does history. Thank you, Arjun.
So I want to shift a little bit. I think, you know, we've, we've all known and experienced in various ways the challenges of this moment. I think we also yearn for sharing of ideas and lessons learned and sort of observations about what is working, what, what is hopeful in terms of how to shift these times, right? Um, so one of the things, again, that struck me about the book is even if people were attacked for one aspect of their identity, whether it was their faith or whatnot, the response, again, many times were as workers, as parents, right, as, as people of multiple faiths, um, as people who cared about their communities, um, as siblings, right, as survivors of violence. And so I, I want to invite us to, in thinking about sharing how things are, you know, how you're seeing things that are hopeful or things that are working, um, to kind of also think about, are there other ways that we can identify with one another, right? Um, are there ways that in this moment we can build and forge new bonds of, of connection and kind of affinity with one another as, as human beings who really care about ending violence? Right? So I'll start with you, Anila. Okay, sure. So um, I will say that I'm very much a hopeful, optimist kind of person, optimistic kind of person. My faith teaches me that. Uh, and I firmly believe that, I, I tell this to people all the time, that as bad as things are right now, and they are pretty bad. I mean, you heard several examples here, um, and we all know from our own lives and what's happening all around us, we know how bad things are. But as bad as they are, I tell people this all the time, it is an amazing time to be alive right now, to be here with all of you, to be sort of in, in this moment present together, because never in my lifetime have I felt that I have as much power to make a difference as I do today. The words and actions by every single one of us here, I believe has a far greater impact in the future of our country than ever before, at least in my lifetime, from my perspective. I firmly believe that sort of the, the coalitions that we're seeing, the unity, the people coming out in solidarity, learning about each other, connecting with communities that they may have never connected with otherwise, all of that, the movement in the streets, the people showing up in mass all around on all a variety of different causes, that gives me so much hope and strength and inspiration and allows me to continue doing the work that I'm doing every single day. So I really want to put that clear because I know we heard a very heavy sort of component from so many different stories and so much of that, that has happened and continues to happen. And I'm not sort of downplaying any of that negativity, but I'm saying we absolutely can be and are part of the solution. And that's what I focus on. The, I focus on what we can do. And there's so much that every single one of us can do. And all, you know, the, this ranges from things at the national level to here at the local level. And I really tell people all the time, the two things that I would especially emphasize personally are sort of education and engagement. Educating ourselves and each other, helping sort of raise awareness about all of these various issues, about these stories, using the stories as a way to help build uh, uh, action, help sort of motivate people to act. Right? Using the stories, those personal connections, because a lot of times people will hate something they don't know or somebody that they don't know. And when you help connect those people and build the personal connections, when they have a human face connected to a community, a marginalized group, it is a lot harder for people to hate. And we have many examples of this happening. And what is happening all around us, especially here in the greater Seattle area. If you don't know of some options and ways to get involved, to educate yourself, to build those personal connections, we have a resource table over there with Maps Amen that has an action sheet. There's the care uh, action sheet as well on combating Islamophobia. There are coalitions all around there, uh, or groups like Seattle Indivisible. 30 seconds. Okay, uh, Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, Faith Action Network. All of these groups are ways to engage and educate ourselves and each other. And just being here today is a sign that every single person here cares. And I believe, the, and I counted, it's about 60 people here, that th those of us here, we have so much power and potential. And if we unite, us alone can change the world. I firmly believe that. And I'm sort of all about action and working together to, to sort of create the kind of change that we all want to see. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Shakori, um, we're all so moved by the story that you shared with us. Please tell us what we can do in this room to support you and your family and support the broader work that you're doing. Um, thank you again for having me here. I, re I really appreciate it. Um, as you were saying, the education part is, is the most important. I think a lot of people here don't know that that place even exists. 
or what's happening inside. So that's important. Um, we like to attack the system. It's very broken, and so that's not very hard to do. Um, basic medical care is something that even the poorest people in our country have. Um, so attacking that is, is what we're trying to do like at the Northwest Detention Center Resistance. But as individuals, um, I would write or call our local officials and tell them that you know what's happening there and that you're not gonna stand for it and be continuous about it. Doing it once or twice is great, but doing it all the time is even better. We call that a call to action. So um, even calling the detention center itself, it, it'll make them do something. It, it, they only do any things when they feel pressure or they feel like there's a tension on them. Then they kind of clean it up a little bit. But I don't want them to clean it up a little bit. I want it to be gone completely. Um, so calling your state officials, um, telling others what's going on. Um, and if you're not sure, you can always go to the Northwest Detention Resistance on Facebook, and there's also a website. You can just Google it, and the link is there. Um, and then right now we have a petition. It's a national petition to end ICE's um, contracts with individual jails and prisons. So what they do is they go, attack, they go grab people, and they put them into the jails temporarily as a holding before they ship them to um, the Northwest Detention Center. And it's possible because in Idaho, they lost their contracts. There's a lot of people from Idaho coming up here to Tacoma because they're, they lost their contracts with the detention center or the jails there. So um, it's definitely possible. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it in other cities happening as more people are caring. Unfortunately, it took people being separated from their parents for people to pay attention. And now there's an outcry for us here in our own backyard because people are sick. It's a crisis and we need that help. So call, complain, complain, and call. Get on their nerves. Thank you, Shakari. <laughs> Matt, um, please tell us what we can do to support the work that you're doing with the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women campaign. Yeah, um, I, I first wanted to, to comment on uh, the, I, I feel the same way in uh, looking at the sort of cross uh, movement, cross community uh, work that has uh, really taken place over the past um, s several years. Uh, even right here in, in Seattle, uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago, we launched a little uh, a, a movement to go after uh, a Wall Street bank called Wells Fargo and to get the city to divest because of its investment in the Dakota Access Pipeline. While we were doing that, we were very deliberate in the uh, campaign to draw in folks who were opposing immigrant detention. We're very deliberate in bringing in the folks who are fighting the new, no, the new youth jail and private prisons because as was mentioned, Geo Group uh, runs that and Geo Group is funded by the likes of Wells Fargo and Bank of America, who are not only financing, but profiting off the exploitation of our lands, the exploitation of our uh, uh, communities. And um, that movement became a global movement that has seen the, the divestment of over $20 billion from the fossil fuel industry and uh, because of what they're doing to communities around the world. So there's a lot of uh, amazing cross work, even the, the work down in uh, Tacoma, that detention center uh, sits on land that was stolen from the Piala people. And uh, the, right next to that facility, not too far away, uh, there's an effort to put in a massive fr uh, fracked gas plant. And I wanna say two weeks ago or so, uh, the Piala tribe uh, and others uh, linked up with uh, folks working against the Northwest uh, Detention Center and, and did a march and showing the joint solidarity and opposition to it. Uh, I'm also hopeful when my wife and I went back to, to Standing Rock and to see the people uh, fr literally around the world who were showing us support. I mean, the Lakota people, there's only 100,000 of us. And when we took that fight against Dakota Access Pipeline, we were getting support and solidarity from people around the world. Uh, we were there on the weekend when uh, all these former uh, military vets came out there and I got the opportunity to sit on the drum and, and sing them in. And uh, honestly, it made me pretty teary-eyed watching these uh, people from around the country coming in 
to support us. And our head man, who, um, you know, he, he welcomed them saying, well, welcome to the fight that natives have been in for the past several hundred years against this own government. So things like that are very hopeful to me. In terms of support, I'd like to invite everybody out on October 8th, you know, uh, about five, four or five years ago, uh, another kind of movement we launched here was to abolish Columbus Day on the local level. There shouldn't be a federal holiday that recognizes a man who started the transatlantic slave trade, who conducted mass genocide against uh, native uh, Tainos, and uh, uh, celebrates colonialism. So we started an effort here locally to abolish that on a, a local level. And, and so uh, it's now Indigenous Peoples Day. And we celebrate all, all day long, and I, I want to invite everybody to come out and celebrate with us. Uh, you can come out in the evening time at a Daybreak Star, get a traditional Coast Salish salmon feed, see uh, we've got Aztec dancers, Taino dancers, and uh, much more, and um, everybody's welcome. So, you know, it's little things like that we can do to chip away at that kind of uh, settler colonial narrative um, and celebrate ourselves and celebrate our beautiful resiliency and the fact that we're still here. And um, thank you. The question was, did I seek like a private medical to go see my husband? Um, so the thing about that is that um, ICE has control over who sees them and who deals with them. So no, uh, we're not allowed to do that. And they have a clinic in-house that they claim is, is good enough for them to be seen by, so they don't need to be seen by anyone else. They gave the same answer with faith leaders. We tried to get a faith delegation to go, and they said, no, 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 we already offer religious services to yeah. them, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very difficult, and I think particularly difficult with these privately run immigration detention facilities to get people inside. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, sorry. So the question is, is it about education or cultural change? So uh, thank you for the question. I, I think it's a valid point. And maybe I should clarify that by education, I don't necessarily mean the formal education, but more like helping educate each other and raise awareness. Uh, well, you know, and one way to do that is simply things like the power of the potluck, as Pastor Terry calls it, right? Like just getting people together. And you could describe that maybe as culture rather than education. And either way, I think it's important. I think it's also important for people to recognize the narrative that exists in our country, because it is built in part based on the culture that we see as American culture, as opposed to a broader culture that includes all of us. You know, for instance, a lot of people are not aware that American Muslims have been part of our country since the very beginning. That estimates are up to, you know, 10 to 30 percent of the human beings who were enslaved from Africa having been Muslim. People don't even know that. They don't think about that when they think of Muslim today, right? So I think it, it does include both. It, it includes the education in terms of awareness raising, but also helping understand what it means when we talk about American culture, who's included, who's excluded, Included, why and how do we write our narratives in a way that is far more inclusive than what it has been historically? And that part of culture change, it's, on, it's incumbent on all of us. Shifting the narrative, reclaiming the message, and reclaiming even things, you know, like the, the term patriotism. A lot of people are opposed to patriotism because they see all this negative stuff happening or they see our foreign policy, and I understand that. But at the same time, we lose the fight, we lose the battle if we just give that up entirely. Instead, what I'm very big on is saying, no, 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 I'm a patriot. I'm what a patriot looks like because I care enough about my country that I'm willing to go out there and fight for change and fight to reach the aspirational ideals that I believe in. That's the kind of narrative change and cultural change that I think we need to see more of. So the question for Arjun is, how did you create a safe space for the people you were interviewing for the book that you wrote? Um. So there's no one size fits all formula. Um, as I mentioned at the end of my remarks, my gateway to survivors um, was predominantly community organizations. So I did reach out to local folks in Portland who I knew were in touch with the family. And in some cases, including in Portland, um, local activists, in that case one, was present in the meeting. Um, and that made the girls comfortable. Um, I think in some ways um, it's actually kind of profound that you know, you're a visibly uh, you know, sick man who's asking me the question, and I'm a sick man, because I will tell you, this is something I've been thinking about recently. Um, I do think that my identity 
was in many ways a passport and gateway to survivors. Because folks look at me and they know that I've experienced it too, just by seeing me. Um, and I think that matters and I think that helps. I think there's a lot of listening involved. Um, I think there's a lot of trust involved. Um, I don't want to spend too much time, but I will say specifically with, with Destiny, Mangum, and William Muhammad, the two young women in Portland, um, the book is the first time they tell their story together. And on Saturday, in two days, we're doing an event together at a mosque, and it'll be the first public appearance they've done. Um, you know, and it almost didn't happen. I went to Portland, we had scheduled a meeting, and they didn't show up. And I kind of faced a test. Do I push? And I didn't. I just let it be. I just sent them a follow-up note and said, I'm here for a couple more days. I reached out to a few more local activists and said, if this can be arranged, great. And it worked out. Um, so in, in, in some ways, it was sort of just kind of a, a process of, of listening. Um, it was sort of a function of my identity. Um, really quickly, before I forget, um, I want to uh, let folks know that we have two also extraordinary people in the room who I met this morning, um, Teresa. Um, her father-in-law was actually um, um, the victim of a terrible hate crime and lost his life some years ago. Um, and I met her this morning. Um, we also have Race in the audience. Um, and he was shot um, just weeks after 9-11 um, and then later created an organization called, um, I believe it's called A World Without Hate. Um, and one of the first campaigns that this organization helped lead, talk about restorative justice, was trying to make sure that the person who shot race and murdered others in violent hate crimes after 9-11 wasn't executed by the state of Texas because he believes in forgiveness and restorative justice. So I just wanted to, to point the two of them out and I had the pleasure of meeting them both this morning. So where can we find out more information to how most effectively advocate if we want to call the Northwest Detention Center? Of course, I don't have any of the papers with me. Left them all in my car. Um, I can show you my phone, of course. Um, we have the number, and we don't really tell you what to say, but aggression is absolutely not what you want to do. Um, you can say to them, that we know what's going on. I've heard this, and this is happening. You guys need to do something about that. And they can't really, you know, they're not going to get mad at you. They can't get mad at you for coming at them in a respectful manner. But it tells them that people are watching them. We're watching you. This is a community of people, and we're watching you. So do something about it. Or, you know, um, get out it. And that's basically what I do to them all the time, is I out them constantly. Um, so always go to them respectful. And if you don't want to call, you can write a letter to the senators um, or the congressmen. Or, you know, they do have some power. They claim that they don't. And quiet as it's kept, I was told that some of them get some funds for their donations when, it come, when they run for for office, so um, money is always a motivator, but so is embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So always go respectfully, always. I'm sure, absolutely, because it brings attention to it. It lets them know that what, what's happening is not a secret. So I just want to share that there is a website. Um, it's www.nwdcresistance.org. And there is, some, there is a call to action, and there are several phone numbers and people to, to call there. Um, and there's a bunch of information on that website. And there should be a petition. The national petition should be on there as well for people to sign uh, to end the contract between ICE and the jails. Um, it's not a set date. We do do it every single month. And uh, now we have two locations because we do it at the SeaTac location and then we do it at the Tacoma location and Tacoma location is where my husband is. The SeaTac one is more of a jail than an immigration center and that's one of the places that has a contract with ICE that holds people before they send them to Tacoma. Um, we notify everything on Facebook, right? That's what basically what we do right now. When something happens like the hunger strikes, that's when we become more active and we start posting, okay, we're gonna go this place this day and this time to keep people posted on us because mostly everybody has a Facebook. There's something that I'm glad you said that because it's really important to show people that 
What they show in media is not what's actually happening in reality. At that detention center, there are way other country cultures and people from other countries that are in that facility that are also suffering. It's not just Mexicans, there's Indian people there, people from Germany. I was shocked when I went to see my husband and I saw them come in and I saw about four Caucasian people. I was like, uh, that's not what they were telling me was happening. Absolutely. So that's super important too. It breaks down a barrier for those that aren't as, um, as um, empathetic or sympathetic for people because they don't look like them. That's a great barrier to knock down. Well, if you don't care because they don't look like you, there's a person right here that looks like you. This person, two of the people that was on hunger strike for 30 days were Russian, and they didn't speak English. And we kept trying to send in attorneys in there to talk to them and you know, get to see what's going on with them and talk with them, but we couldn't get an attorney in there because the detention center wouldn't let us have lawyers to do visits because they threw them in solitary confinement. So. There's nothing like actually going into the detention center, into prisons, you know, to really see what's going on and who it's impacting. It's not necessarily what we're told. Um, so I want to just thank everybody who came out tonight and everybody on this panel, Arjun, for your brilliance, for your commitment, for your integrity, and to the Seattle Public Library and everyone who supported this event. And I just want to leave us with um, another quote from, from Arjun's book, which I thought was really lovely, which is really how you end, um, which is, you say, we will teach them to forgive and reconcile because empathy and tenderness are innate to who we are. We will build community and thrive. We will press on just like we have always done. So with that, I say good night to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.